Good evening, everyone. So excited to be reading here. Um, so I'm going to read a few poems to start off, and then I'm going to pass it off to Sammy. And so we're going to take turns doing that. In the midst of that exchange, if you have questions, please write them down, you know, because we want this to be more of a conversation than a presentation. I wanted to start off by talking about the connection to this particular exhibit. Um, in looking at displacement and its profound effect on identity formation, I wanted to start inward tonight um, and work myself outward, meaning the body is often the first place of displacement where an environmental shift or even the threat of one can cause someone to become a very different version of themselves. And I wanted to start with what it's like to notice something has changed within yourself, but the outside world itself um, hasn't noticed yet. And you start to begin to notice the type of strangeness that, um, you know, Ray Dalton addresses in the film, like there's something that's, you just can't name it just yet. And I chronicled that in a poem, um, the title poem of this book, of When My Body Was a Clenched Fist, and it's a poem titled My Body as a Clenched Fist. And it is five sections, but I'm only going to be reading two sections. But I'll tell you the five sections are after the five boroughs of New York City, so it is paying homage to the city where these poems were forged, but also five as in the number of digits in a hand to make a fist. And the first section is affliction, the second one is aftermath, the third is metamorphosis, uh, the fourth is retaliation, and the fifth one is revolution. And basically, I talk about how displacement a number of times is very much like trauma, or very much like a mutant, you know, being infected with some type of foreign substance, and then their body begins to transform. So I'm going to read the first two sections of My Body as a Clenched Fist. Affliction. It was a gust, no, a burst of air that brought the coil to my hands time and again. And no matter what I did to flex, it didn't budge. And almost always brought me back to Leon walking beside me. Then it once felt motion not there, except for the treads of his shoes making its way down the street he didn't know was a one way, the wrong way. When he doubled back, it was clear that something cannibalized the way home. I vetted the treetops for a place to perch, a vantage point beyond the crowd that had gathered to watch the fight, but there was no fight. It was all one-sided, seven strike that, ten strike that, eighteen strike that, twenty pair of fists and Timberland boots bared down into the boy, and the only sight of fight in him was his body boiling up like a fist to brace the rush of even more fists. What could I do? What could I have done? They had begun to also cannibalize passers-by and onlookers. I did what was customary. Collected faces for the diurnal course when there'd be another way to put fear and the tears into a vista that would involve more fists, but that day never came. And when the fury is strong against the court of young fists, when anger is calibrated with a fondness for rancor, there is only one end to fight monsters. You must yourself become a monster. Two, aftermath. There was no sign it ever took place. No dents in the universe. No visible wounds from where the paratroopers landed their blows. No traces of Leon. No parallel bruise in your ribs or spine. Just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sun. No physical wreckage, shards of bones, or raging fire, or smoldering carcass. Just an echo in your bones and veins. And in the fists you packed for the day. Just sun, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sun. No shortcuts, same streets, same trees, and you staring at yourself like the body's purpose was to harbor this universe of cavity, wide enough to muse. Maybe there was still a way, so certain there was still a way to walk away or undo what was done, but with no body, no witnesses, no one to talk to, no Leon back at school, no sign the universe was ever disturbed except in your bones and in the loaded fists you carry in your pocket. You sat in class, reviewed homework like you always did, later at recess in that odd, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful son, whispering to the ball in your hand, shot taker and rebounder, because even at 13 you already knew that sometimes teeth are a gateway to the city of one's understanding, and other times they are a gate for what ails, and with no credible witness to corroborate, other than your own reflections in storefront windows, the ceaseless parading of two bodies, a balancing double barrel pair of fists, you settle into the glaring aftermath, alone glazing that beautiful, 
beautiful, beautiful sun. I'm going to ask you to take a breath with me because with these poems sometimes it's helpful to take a deep breath and exhale. So can you take one with me, please? Thank you. When I talk about what it's like to have the body transform in that way, it's hard to talk about the experiences that led me to even write these poems. I mean, I grew up in New York City, but I was born in Haiti. And so I fled a country that was, had a lot of political unrest, much like what's happening now. And I came into a city, you know, I came into the middle of the crack epidemic in New York City. And as such, this little boy, nine, 10 years old, is trying to figure out what it meant to be at home, to feel at home. And I think when we talk about displacement, whether it's political or economic or social, one is forever on this quest to find something that is familiar to them, something that has a semblance of what they call home. The next poem I'm about to read before I transition to Sammy is a poem about the moment when one realizes that this ain't Kansas anymore. <laughs> you know, in my case, this was Jamaica, Queens at the peak of the crack epidemic. And how uh, this young version of myself was trying desperately, right, was seeking something that reminds him of home. And there's a poem paying homage to the block that I grew up on, which is 161st Street. It's a poem titled, Elegy for 161st Street. This is also an homage to hip hop as well, because I came of age with hip hop in Queens, New York at that time. And so um, there is one reference that I do want to mention in here, which is Benson and, and Hedges. Does anyone know what that is? Yeah. <laughs> and you'll notice that times had changed. <laughs> um, that was back when kids were able to go to the grocery store and get their parents a pack of cigarettes. Elegy for 161st Street. Five furious years after Grandmaster Flash pen a rap about edges, you zigzag the corners and run for Benson and Hedges. Back when the zeitgeist of the block was crack and your father had that used pale blue Pontiac you would dash the family into on Friday nights, trying to counter the myopic pull of the block's high danger of dope fiends and the debilitating euphoria in a whimsical gaze way laid like mazes. You sat in the back seat and other under your breath. Why would anyone ever trade in nights on the palm trees for these qualm nights? For the menacing overtone of a smile without teeth? Because you've come to learn the most important lesson is to master your own gaze and strut. For the days when soon enough you'd be spit back onto the same strip of block, or twice a woman with eyes belonging to that dragged out and quintessential gaze proffered you an act of fellatio for five dollars. You were 10 years old on an errand to buy milk in a flagellous galaxy, but carried the weight of her bid on all future quests to the grocery store when the concrete sparkled like a sky full of stars under your feet. You were grateful for the drift of Friday nights when street telemetry took a back seat to the only sign of life, a magnificent breeze against your face. Thanks for that. So I think part of um, the whole idea of displacement, a, p a large piece of that is leaving or having to leave, right? And my father grew up in Puerto Rico. And when he left Puerto Rico, all his father could ask him is, por qué te vas? Why are you leaving, right? So this is a piece kind of taking on that, that question. Um, in a small house made of cement, the cane cutter's children became men and women who departed. And when asked, por qué te vas, avoided the eyes. They packed the small suitcases that poverty supplied the contents for. Suited up in their vests, they boarded a Pan Am flight, waking in Los Nueva York to the song of sewing and the hum of machines that made their dance faster than the one farms and cane fields taught them. Upon receipt, whoops, they sent their images back to those who stayed standing behind pedestals that declared, te quiero, or on rooftops, cityscapes behind them that said, I am more, 
but did not acknowledge how little they had. Upon receipt, the cane cutter would sit on his porch, open the airmail envelope, and wish them back. Wanting children he could touch, rather than the images that reminded him of empty rooms. In time, empty rooms became an empty house that did not mourn absence, but crumbled under the weight of vacancy. Over the pandemic, I was spent a lot of time cutting up National Geographic magazines and pulling words and lines from articles and old ads and creating poems out of those. Um, and it's crazy, like, what you can put together when you're doing that. So this is a piece called Home that was built in that way. When it's time to leave it all behind, discard button, bead, or bobble. Leave all things unfamiliar. Be sure not to miss the boat. People are moving quietly, migratory birds in flight. Many immigrants land in a city of so many places. Everyone sooner or later finds one special they name home. Then I'll, uh, I'll end this set with um, a piece called Lechon, which is roast pig. Um, because it's like a tradition that my family has from the campo in, uh, in, in Gurabo, in Puerto Rico, but also that I saw happen all the time in the empty yards and lots, lots in the Bronx, and then that I started doing in my backyard in D.C., right? So lechon. Carcass beside a carcass, one of metal, one of flesh, both waiting to be scavenged. One, by men who have become adept at removing things that serve no purpose where they sit and turning them into a working part or an extra dollar. The other, by the children who stand like crows congregating near roadkill to wait for a piece of cuerito that they can peel right off. Machete en la capota. The hand that grips its hilt will slice through flesh and bone of the roasting animal or el animal, who doesn't understand the sharp edge of a machete will cut the guapo out of him. Carcass beside a carcass, proving the dead serve a purpose. And the living will congregate anywhere the smell of well-seasoned meat fills the air enough to house the memory of home, even when home is only a story that your mother tells you. While she sits in a house dress, hair wrapped around rollers, feet slipped into chanclas, and planted firmly on ground she can't root into, because here only weeds take root, and she is a flamboyant. You know, I had some notes prepared, but because this is what I love about poetry readings, right? So I said, you know what? Let me do an audible and read this poem. And you'll notice some connections between the poem that Sammy just read and this next poem here. Uh, when we talk about being in transit, there's the idea that I'm looking for a place to belong, right? And maybe we've made enough progress for that to happen. And then I'm in Massachusetts driving down, you know, Storage Drive, which is one of the main traffic, <laughs> you know, um, stops of Boston. And then there was this sign that said, if you lived here, you'd be home now. And it just threw me into this crazy meditation on what that sign meant. And so this is the poem that came out of it. It's a poem titled, Elegy for the American Dream. When it reads, this could be you, it doesn't mean you. You are not the they or them of advertisements. You are the dead array in time of Pablo Neruda's The Chosen Ones, the butt of jokes and machetes. 
You are not a feature in these stories. You are the withheld sneeze. You are the closed mouth cough. A cup yawn. You are a hearsay. You are the practical omission of first editions and reports. Not even byline in the scene of bread and end wine. You are an insect. Not the target of ads that said, if you lived here, you'd be home now. You are a dog's yelp in the back of a truck, soon to be fairy tale as the Hosanna of Hyena Ghost. You are at best a funeral hymn, which means your body is a grave site, and the city in which you orbit is a mass grave to which not everyone in this ad is invited. I kept thinking about what that poem meant for me, and was Haiti home or was here home? And if you keep finding these spaces, these tiny spaces that grow to be much bigger than that and keep saying, you don't really live here. And so I said, where is home? And of course, for me to disconnect from that, I go to one of my favorite places to go, which is space. And so for like a summer, I indulge in everything astrophysics. I mean, every single thing that was out there, I geeked out on it from reading books, I had audio books, I had video, sometimes I had all three of them on at the same time, writing feverishly and taking notes and taking everything in. And I realized that we are the universe. And one of the key facts that I learned was the dust that we breathe is actually not just skin cells, right, but also dust from space. And I said, so if that's the case, maybe space is a safer way to manage this. But then we start to talk about what it's like to make that decision on your own. So when we talk about displacement, we're talking about you're comfortable, you want to make a decision, but you want to make it on your own. But what happens when you get pushed into making that decision? This next poem is a poem titled Voyager, and it's after uh, the Voyager satellite that was launched the year that I was born. And until this day, it was 77, until this day, it's still sending signals back about the outer reaches of the universe. And I kind of asked this question, I said, we care so much about Pluto and the composition of Neptune when someone like me is dying and we can't figure out how to stop that from happening. So this is a poem titled Voyager. And it does blend in the experiences of being both immigrant and black in this country. Voyager. You are a speck, azure and dust, in a galaxy called Potential. Potential to bust in that, what have you done for me lately, Milky Way? Weight of the weight says stop caring before the world does in that you're not going to amount to anything worth remembering like a rogue planet, immigrant and black, second born, brother of your father's son, a speck through the lens of ephemeral gazes and constant stares. You master constellations like mazes, the eyes rolling blue planets and others filled with oceans in awe of the possibilities, galaxies light years away, while at home cities become oceans and black moons become dust, and every day, something threatens to launch you into the interstellar space of your very own body. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of follow that with another one of those uh, collage poems that this is called Protection from Predators. Mm. A young man asks his father why blacks in, America, in the United States feel unwelcome as one of the Americans who survived. Oh Lord, won't you buy me? Protection from predators. Armor against decay. Listen, this is tough to admit. Time has not eased the grief of a woman whose son has died. Prayer softens hard times for families. I would like to think so, but no. One day I called on Nina. She still smelled of charred flesh, raising a hymn on Sunday, barbed but beautiful. So home for Puerto Ricans kind of like, you know, goes back to that idea that he said of where do you exactly belong? Because um, we are a colony. 
right? Um, so this is a piece called Looking for My Citizenship. Mm -hmm. When I am unsure of who I am, I pick up my dominoes and search out the Reverendo Pedro Pietro so we can pray for clarity. I find him in front of the botanica. We slam the bones onto a card table, become domino table, become seat of divination. He fingers a double zero, y canta la borinquena. If you can't fly, swim to the Spirit Republic of Puerto Rico, he tells me. So I wait in line at the Puerto Rican Passport Agency, listening to the click clack of the monk who types my identity into a dream I have every madrugada. Where you headed, my friends ask, a state of mind, where plena always comes to my rescue, banging out the news from El Barrio or Los Aida or El Bronx, all places I run to, then from, then back to again, <coughs> borderless. Then uh, read one, one more like short series, a series of short poems that look at objects left in the desert by migrants coming to the U.S. Um, there's an organization that was collecting those up and cataloging them. Um, desert. This sun wants to melt me into sands that would cover the reminders of me. Wants to bleach bones left exposed, turn them into landmarks, passes by will ignore. Desert object one, zapatos. Shoes, a child size three. Worn, they know more miles than they should. How old were you? Do the number of holes in the soles match your losses. Desert object two, Diccionario Inglés Español, Spanish English Dictionary, pages yellowed by use and sun. What were you hoping to say? Wanted to say, you are the reason. Wanted to say, I am need. Wanted to say, my child is like yours. Wanted to say, a dream is built out of necessity. Wanted to say, separation is never a decision made lightly. Desert object three, botella de agua con crucifijo, water bottle with crucifix. Does this make the water holy? When lips were parched, did this water bless them? When it was left behind, was the lack of it torture, a nail puncturing flesh? Desert object four, caja de cigarrillos. A pack of cigarettes, only four left. How long have you been traveling? Did you smoke one every morning as a simple routine to hold on to? Did you exchange one for conversation between drags? Was it your last? Mm. You know, Sammy was talking about objects being left as a representation of who someone is. And I started to think about what it meant to have that level of representation. That Freddie Gray happened. Freddie Gray, Freddie Gray was born and raised in Baltimore. This was his city. He knew it like the back of his hand. He was no stranger to that space, but yet, Something happened to Freddie Gray to disrupt the entire city. But I'll tell you what the news focused on and all the political pundits, CVS. Why were they destroying CVS? And I said, someone just died in police custody. And then I said, maybe they're not seeing Freddie Gray as a person. So let us take the fact that this is not a person that this happened to. I'm going to add the blackness portion later on, but let's just take this is not a person this happened to. Anyone here ever drive their car and like a can fell out of the grocery bag or something and it's in the back of the car and you can hear it, right? I know some people don't pull over right away, it doesn't matter if it's the highway, whatever, because you don't want to hear that sound. So I want you to keep that in mind as I read this, these sections of the Freddie Gray Suite, which is a poem titled Gray's Anatomy. 
Imagine a tin can semi-erotic clang as it is transported without restraint in a back of an empty loaded truck. Imagine a rag doll or the fling of a mop's flop or a rogue freshly peeled honeydew melon at the mercy of the groove floor bed of a truck. Imagine a shell and a soft boiled egg or a baked sweet potato rolling off the makeshift counter of a bench. Imagine it is being tossed in the truck like it is born of a dumb sag nation. Imagine it has ears and can hear itself crack open. Imagine you can hear it crack open in the back of a truck and it sounds like a tea kettle whistle. Imagine it is the sound the throat makes when it has broken away from its voice box. Imagine a man attached to the voice and the throat and the sound of a cry that sounds like something is cracked open. And imagine he tosses haplessly in that metal truck and nobody gives a fuck, not the driver of the truck or how the man's body failed to flutter to the ground as he lost consciousness, how the clanging of cuffs were one of the last sounds he heard and how his gut may have felt when he entered the back of that truck. He was on the verge of being relegated to compost. I kept thinking about if Freddie Gray was still considered to be property, more of a fuss would have been made about his death because America is still concerned about property. Now, that's just one person dying. What about how he died? In whose hands did he die? I geek out on research a lot, so a lot of these poems were tough for me to write because I had to sit with court transcripts, you know, investigative reports, and the autopsy report, which is accessible to all of us, gave some pretty good information about this. So the last two pieces that I'm going to read, one has to do with what I discovered in the autopsy report, and then the rest is, what does this mean for us if Freddie Gray died and no one was held responsible for his death? Report has it, a ball to left an impression on your head. It's how they determined your life was not secured properly. There was no harness or safety net. You left, a twin, you left behind a twin sister. She might have felt what you felt. That's not even close to the beginning of how we've dealt. Same headlines and proverbial bob and weave. He resisted arrest by jabbing the air with his head. Must have been how it happened. Next, keep breaking trust falls of those who, are, who serve and protect. What we have been saying is a man whose daily rations is time spent kneeling is not a zealot, but a man in the unrelenting custody of one out to drop a city of black faces into the most woe begone. And we let them. City snaps a neck and writes a check. And we let them. No one's held responsible for your death and Radical revolution begins with a revelation. revelation, the end of values, and to the number of times one forces the mind and tries to rehab hope as alternate ending to a life being hauled cuffed in the back of a van so that hands cannot brace, fall, or bull rush or swerves. Because we don't lose the same. He was left to a hush of nerves, premature ending, and three fractured vertebrae and crushed voice box. No matter who consented or whose myth of our breeds does black men fugitives, whose news makes one alter in a pistol, another one grave, or whose blue lines the streets too often, radical rotation begins with loss, which means being woke is never the same as being awake in one's own body. And because we don't lose the same amount of sleep, not over three fractured vertebrae or a crushed voice box, it is all a tragic end, and one does not need eyes to see this. Place a hand on the page, and you can make out the breaking of his voice. It is like the clearing of your throat. I'm gonna... That's why I love reading with other people. Because you can sit back and relax for a minute and be like, damn. <laughs> you know? I wish I had that line. <laughs> you know? Um, all right. 
So I'm gonna actually, and just a note, this book was my first book, and it was actually published by this gentleman back here. Mm -hmm. hey. so, Central Square. You know, Central Square Press. Yeah. Um, so these are like a series of pseudo guzzles, um, and I'll read two sections of an eight section piece. Um, I write, I wrap feet in strips of burial cloth so I can remember why I travel. I watch others leave until their bodies became a distance to travel. I pound my chest, driving away the demons of silence brought by departure. Each slap marking the tempo that my feet will keep as I travel. My feet are wrapped tightly, but I do not slide them into shoes. I want the soles to feel the road, to blister, to be cut by the miles I travel. I do not want to leave. This is not a road I have chosen to follow. This is an exile, demanded by guns and bombs, so I must travel. There is no need for you to describe loss. I revisit the image daily. It has helped me map the road that will pull the breath from me as I travel. This road is not a place you return from, not a place to believe in. I have left belief behind within the carcass of a home that bid me travel. Your eyes are open wide. They stare at a sky full of stars. Are the constellations a single entity or a multitude of stars? The heavens seem to tremble if you stare long enough. Do your eyes see the couples dancing in the brightness of the stars? Do Orion and Cassiopeia listen to boleros filling the space between them? Do they grab hold when no one is watching and dance? Or are they just stars? Is this a magic trick? An illusion that plays with your position in relation to the night sky, making you see more than just stars? Does the sight of the North Star fill you with fear? Make you think departure will be necessary? Make you close your eyes to banish the stars? Or do you welcome the beauty of an open ocean and the sky made brighter by the presence of constellations telling the story of the stars? Is this your story? One where darkness is filled only with the light of small dots over the miles you travel, a road of stars. This is going to be the last poem that I read, and I think Sam might do one more too, right? And then we get into the, because we want this to be a conversation. But again, you would think that we planned this because the poem I wanted to read deals with stars, right? <laughs> and poetry is really about asking questions. And that's why I loved it as a kid, and I still do it till this day, because I'm not looking to answer any questions. But as difficult as these poems were to write, at some point I came to the conclusion where I can't be in, I, I can't be in charge of answering these questions myself. Because I gotta work on taking care of myself and then my two young boys, you know, who are becoming a little bit older, but they're becoming like the type of folks that people don't see as kids anymore, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's the experience of black boys. How do I know that? When my body was a clenched fist was that experience. <laughs> and so I said, you know what, I need to take care of myself. So I said, let me write a poem that simply asked the world, what should I do with all of this? What should I do with all this Freddie Gray stuff and George Floyd, all that stuff, what should I do? And it's a poem titled, When Night Fills With Premature Exits. And shout out to Public Enemy, by the way. Um, whose album, Fear of a Black Planet, really made me think about, maybe that is the fear, right? That is what's driving this. So I said, well, let me ask a few questions. When night fills with premature exits. 
Is there a place where black men can go to be beautiful? Is there light there, touch? Is there comfort or room to raise their black sons as anything than a future asterisk, at risk to be asteroid or rogue planet, but not comet? To be studded with awe and clamor and admired for radio trajectories across a dark sky made of asphalt and moonshine? To be celebs and deemed a magnificent I'm going to read a pair of poems, and they're written in the voices of my great-grandmother and her sister. So my grandfather, when he died, left like trunks full of images and letters. And, and when you would ask him, my abuelo, tell me a story, he'd go, for what? It don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd be like, and then when he dies, I go in his closets, and there's like these, all these stories, right? Mm -hmm. So I always tell folks, when you go home, if you got your people around still, get the stories, right? Take it from them, even if they don't want to give them to you, right? Um, but this is the Amina goes to the beach to feel light again. The city was built on myth, but the storyline did not include how alone one could feel when surrounded by millions. The tale left out how the days would push your lips together tight as railroad tracks. Took the train here so I could wash away my loneliness. I root myself in this water's salty calm, let the light waves push against knees, wrinkled and veined in blue. Solitude in this sea is such a smaller load, a lighter thing. Josefina goes to the rooftop to remember home. This city is not a place I welcome. So I look for those places where I can have some memory of home. This rooftop is the closest thing to mountaintop that I have found. So I stand here to be photographed, but my lips refuse to smile. They take the same stance as my hands, cara dura. Both are hard, calloused. Smiles are reserved for home for mountaintops, not rooftops. And even there, they rarely find a place to live. we should take a moment to, to breathe again. I, I find myself holding my breath when other poets are reading. I don't do it when I'm reading, but when I'm listening to Sammy and Enzo especially, I have to remind myself to breathe. So breathe in, breathe out. And I'm gonna ask you to just show your appreciation for these two poets and what they've read thus far. both. I know, I know the work that goes into writing a poem. The work that you both put into bringing your lives and your experience to the page and through the page to the wider world is unmatched in my experience. I, I find myself stopping and considering the world anew every time I read your poems or hear you read them. And thinking today in terms of displaced, in terms of displacement, I found myself thinking about how intersectional that term is, in the sense that you are not just folks recognizing your displacement from your family of origin, place of origin, but like a boat displaces water, when you are walking through America, you are displacing yourself again. 
And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about whether writing these poems helped you reckon with that, or whether that's an ongoing process. I mean, I'm always displaced in some way or another, yeah. right? Whether that be you don't fit in here, you don't fit in there. I'm a teacher, so my students make sure I understand that I gotta continuously find my place, right? And understand it um, so I can understand them, right? So I think displacement for me has been a space of learning. You know, university, going to a, a predominantly white university after living in a, you know, in a borough that was predominantly black and brown, um, like living, you know, in a space that for a number of years that really was me trying to come to terms with who I was, right? So displacement for me is about, okay, I'm here, I'm not here, what do I do about it? What do I have to learn to make sure that I can make a place for myself here, wherever I am, right? So I think that's, I don't know if that answers your question necessarily, but you know, I think that's really what, what this placement does for me, because we're constantly there, right? So we did a workshop in, in um, high schools the past couple of days and the workshop is, the prompt was, you know, what do you bring with you to the spaces that you enter? And I think in answering that question, I think about the idea of carrying these bags, right? And you put together whatever you can when you're moving from one space to the other. Sometimes you get a warning, other times not so much. And I think about what it means to always carry something with you, like it's packed up. And I think poetry itself gave me the opportunity to create, to break ground. So if I'm not here, I don't belong here, I can literally carve out my own space. Mm -hmm. And I can write this, I can write it in Creole, broken English, whatever it was that I started to write. And so when I started to write, it was writing scripts. So I didn't start off with poetry, but I was writing about the experiences in the neighborhood and I used my classmates' names as characters. And so one found their name in the story and they said, oh, let me see what's going on. And then they told the other classmates. But soon enough, people were reading this. Now, keep in mind, this is a Haitian kid that couldn't speak English well, was teased and made fun of. So writing became a way for me to express myself. And I learned that on paper, everyone's grammar was bad. So, <laughs> um, so but they enjoyed it. And I, and I asked them why. And they said, well, this kind of stuff goes on in our neighborhood but no one writes about it, especially not from the perspective of kids. And so I recognized in that moment that I'm out of place, but I can find a connection with other people. And so even if it is for a brief moment, even if it is for one poem, in that moment we're sharing a space together, we're sharing an experience together. Mm -hmm. And I love the idea of starting the poem with what you bring with you. Because even if you've been displaced from what you consider home, you are still carrying, whether it's possessions like those cataloged, left behind in the desert, whether it's the stories of your family, uh, an entire trunk full of them, what does it matter? Um, I'd love to hear a bit about who the people are that you carry with you, whether it's ancestors, whether it is literary ancestors, whose memories accompany you when you come to the page or when you come to a reading? Mm. Most of my body of work is based on conversations with other people. Mm. <laughs> my visual art and my poetry, so, I mean, I'm carrying all them folks. Like, I have a body of work based on my grandfather's stories that I kind of had to piece together from what he left behind, right? I have a body of work based on the bass player that I perform with, mm -hmm. who's just tells these beautiful stories when you sit down and have a bottle of wine with him, right? And then a uh, balsero Cuban guy who came to the US on a raft who's a painter, 
So he did a bunch of paintings, and then I wrote a series of poems about his paintings. So we all sat at a table together in some way or another and shared with each other like what these stories are. So when I think of who I'm carrying, I'm carrying all those folks. Mm -hmm. And the students that I work with, because a lot of my writing at the beginning was about my students because my students were the ones who forced me to write, mm -hmm. right? Because they were like, if you ain't writing, why should I? <laughs> so I would sit and write with them every assignment that I gave them, mm -hmm. right? These are 14 year olds and I lost my first poetry contest to one of my students. <laughs> no less, huh? We'll keep you humble. Oh yeah. yeah. It's like go cry in a corner. <laughs> one of the, one of the best compliments that I've ever received and till this day happened in junior high school where being the emotionally <laughs> and you know, quiet kid in the corner, but writing all sorts of stuff, you know, about love and all that stuff. So I shared this poem with one of my classmates, and they walk away, and I'm watching their reaction, I see nothing. And then they come back to me, and I was like, dang, it was that bad? Like, they're really taking some time to tell me how bad it was. And then when she got closer, I saw there were tears streaming down her face. Mm -hmm. I was like, dang, it was that bad? <laughs> like, it broke her tears, right? And then she paused, and she says, this is exactly what I went through at this particular time, mm -hmm. and you found the words for that experience. And so it brought her to tears. And I remember thinking later on that it didn't matter whether or not I got published. Because I got a lot of rejections throughout the time. I always went back to that comment and say, we have the ability to put words to experiences. Not everybody has that. And when I go back to where that started, you know, toughest question is, who are you reading these days? I'm like, I'm channeling people from, you know, like I come from, a heritage of storytellers and so as a kid I remember on Friday or Saturday nights being in Haiti we gather around and people were telling stories as a kid I jump in you know I want to tell no you know kids don't you know kids don't tell stories in their circles right so they had a grown so, yes exactly but I paid attention and I was I was like if I can't say it I'm gonna write it and so eventually like, I'm a storyteller, but they were telling the story for the sake of connection. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, Sam, it's for continuity of, of the family, of the heritage. That's how it gets passed down, because as you know, the difficult stuff people don't talk about. Yeah. Yeah. And so I said, okay, you can take the jokes. I'll, I'll take the difficult stuff, <laughs> you know, and I'll carry that forward. But I think it is about that. It is about connecting with people, even if it is one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm interested in, in the vein of connection. Yeah. Um, you know, it, there's sort of a, a running joke among poets that, you know, it's like, oh, I hope my mother doesn't read this. Oh, God, if my brother reads that, I'm in really deep trouble. How does that work for you, not only with your immediate family, but with your communities? I mean, I'll, I'll say a couple of things about, well, I'll tell a couple of anecdotes, right? So I have a student whose father brought her to my house and said, can she stay with you? Um, and he, I said, let's talk about it tomorrow, come to the school, and his wife wouldn't let her back in the car. So she ends up staying with me and my wife that night, and the next day we had to find a place for her to stay, right? I wrote a poem about that. And years later, that student took that poem to her writing class, mm. right, and shared it with them. Um, when it comes to like the folks that I'm writing about, often it's an exchange. Actually, it's always an exchange, right? So I'm not, I'm not writing about you necessarily. I am translating whatever you're telling me, mm -hmm. right? And then we're working on that together. So with Pepe, with the bass player, for example, I would go, I would sit in the basement with him and drink some wine and he'd be like telling me these stories. I go home, I'm like, I cannot write that. So I write the poem and then I go back because, you know, I like wine. Um, and <laughs> we sit together and he like, he listens to the poems that I wrote. He's like, hold on, hold on. He goes to get his bass 
and he starts playing a bass line to go with the poem. And I'm like, yes, that's what I want, mm -hmm. right? Because it's not, I think oftentimes, especially for black and brown folk, the stories that are told are not told by us, right? And they're still about us. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of what I, what I try to write is in conversation with other folks, mm -hmm. right? And trying to be as true to that particular story as possible, right? Um, so I'm not taking this story, I'm retelling it, and then they need to okay that. You know, in some way. And if Pepe ever said, that's some trash, mm -hmm. I'd be like, that poem's not going in there. <laughs> right? Or, damn, I gotta rewrite it. Right? So there's always a conversation. You know? Because I'm, a lot of my work is collaborative. So, yeah. I think, for me, the crossroad is being both Caribbean and American, right? Because I've been here long enough to be. Because <laughs> um, I think about, the distinction between black and African American. My heritage is very different. I come from a nation where we were independent. My teachers were black. The store clerk was black. Like all the shop, whatever. Like you were running to people that looked like you and they were in position, you know, for good or for bad, politicians, even the leaders of the country, right? We didn't have to wait this very long to have a black president. Mm -hmm. So that's a very different experience from the African-American experience, right? And that diaspora. And so I embody blackness, especially with this book, but I was also conscious of what experience is not being told here, right? And so I didn't zoom in and try to tell, as Sammy mentioned, tell somebody else's story. Because there's a lot of erasure, there's a lot of you know things not being told, and there's also this co-opting of information as well, right? We grab this part of the story, we create a tagline, we create a chant, and then that's what everyone repeats. And one of those particular stories is Rihanna Taylor, mm -hmm. right? And so it was kind of like, you know, she was killed while lying in her own bed. But then you read the transcript, it's like she called 911 because she heard something outside of her door. Now if you're in that neighborhood, you say to yourself, I hear somebody outside but it was the police. And so she was calling 911 for the police outside and she still ends up getting killed. Yeah. And so when I read, I kind of allowed other poems, other poets to tell a story. So I don't try to tell a story that Sammy would tell. Yeah. You know, I just sit back and say, okay, what about this can I share from my perspective that I think can further the conversation? And as such, I'm not representing one particular group or one particular idea in general, but I'm just presenting, I'm just one voice in this great medley of voices. I, I just got chills, so <laughs> forgive me. Um, I want to, to switch gears a little bit and ask about process because Sammy, I, I love the idea that you were taking old National Geographics and cutting them up and stitching them together to create something entirely new. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you, how you figured out how to do that, why to do that. I know you said it was during the pandemic, so I'm guessing you may have had some time on your hands. Yeah, and like I had, I think, I had worked at a school that had a bunch of old National Geographic mm. that they were going to get rid of. Mm. Like from the 1950s to the 1970s, mm. right? So I took them home and they've been sitting on the shelf in my studio for years, really. And then in a pandemic that my table was empty and I put the magazines on and I like, what do we do, you know? And then I just started cutting out first lines mm. and then words from ads and then like laid out a whole like table full of clippings and just started moving things around and like taking things from different spaces and started forming these little poems, right? That came out of that. Um, and it was, it was super interesting for me because a lot of the poems were about race, right? About acceptance 
And if you look at the National Geographic in the 1950s to the 1970s, that was some racist shit. Okay. <laughs> you know? So it's kind of like, you know, it made sense, right? So I just kept looking, right? And looking, and I just did. I mean, I think I wrote like 50 of those, mm. you know? And it was just like, I mean, some of it was about drinking too, <laughs> but it was just kind of like these like poems that just started to be formulated. And it, it was like you just found the words you needed to express an idea. And it was during the time of like, you know, George Floyd and like, so a lot of what came up was around that bitterness in many ways, you know? So, the, you know, they were, they were kind of angry at times, but they were also like stuff that, like I was trying to find like some of that hopefulness because also the, the idea of being locked in the house, I love my wife, but <laughs> you know, that I had to find ways to distract myself, mm -hmm. right? And that was one of them. Well, and what Sammy doesn't mention is that he's an incredible visual artist, too. Right? Incredible yeah. visual artist. Um, and that's one of the beautiful things about, like, getting to know him as a person um, and, and seeing how he works. Because a lot of my work is based on many different types of mediums, so I take a lot of visual art. Um, I'm the worst person to go to a museum with because I will stay at that one painting we're like, can we move on? I'm like, no, there's just something about this painting. Go back around, you know, and I could still be staring at it because whenever something speaks to me, you know, I go there and I use film references, mm -hmm. like with a lot of these poems, like I zoom in so that way you can feel something, right? And the whole idea of, you know, crowding, yeah. right? You can feel the pressure, you can feel intense, right? And I do that in the poems as well, so when you're reading them, you can feel that pressure. And I do want you to exhale, I give you that out, right? But it, for me, it's about music, mm -hmm. mostly too, right? So I consider every book that I write to be a record. And this is probably coming of age, you know, in Queens, New York with hip hop, right? I consider it an album. And so every book that I write, every poem is, I consider like the soundtrack of either my life or life in general. So like, Time Magazine or National Geographic can capture the zeitgeist of a time, I want my poems to be able to do that too. So that way you can say, oh, how was it like to go through the pandemic doing this? How was it like to be in Queens, New York during the crack epidemic? Mm -hmm. And I want to place you there flavor-wise, music-wise, you know, rhythm-wise, and music is always that thread for me. And so each book has a different rhythm. Yeah, it does, and both of you, write such intensely musical poems. I, there's so much care put into word choice, there's so much thought put into the rhythm, and I, I'm just gonna ask this process question. Do you write with music on, or do you write in silence? It depends on the day, but I read with musicians, mm. right? So I, what I found is that I've been reading with the same bass player since 1996, mm. and when I started reading with him, he would look at me and shake his head. And I'm like, what's wrong, Pepe? And he's like, Sammy, you're not a vocalist, which is true, I can't sing anything. He said, you're a trumpet. You are another instrument in the band. Figure out your spaces, figure out your breaths, leave some space for me, mm. right? So every time I would read with him, I had to keep that in mind, and then I would go home and revise my poems, mm. right? Because then I start hearing the bass line, or I start hearing him saying, Sammy, you're a trumpet, right? <laughs> and then I'm like, okay, bah, all right, there, you know? <laughs> but it was like, I started figuring out more about what spaces were needed, mm. and what silences were needed, right? Mm. And I tried to make sure that however I laid the poem out on the page, allowed for that, mm. right? So I always tell people, Pepe Gonzalez, the bass player, taught me how to read poetry, yeah. right? Mm. And helped me revise my poems. You know? I love that. Okay. Music is always yeah. playing for me. Okay. You know, whether it was in my house, cleaning, mm. cooking, mm. there was always some type of, you know, music playing. And when I write, um, I'm a playlist guru. I can, I have like, thousands of, and I can figure out a particular playlist for a particular mood, 
right? If you tell me you're feeling this way, I'm like, okay, I got the soundtrack for you. And all the songs you fit that. I don't know how that happened, but it just sort of happened that way. So when I write, I take all different aspects of music. I cannot play one instrument. I tried. <laughs> I tried to play guitar, I tried to play the piano. Um, my fingers just wouldn't do what I wanted them to do. But there's, that, there's this essence of words that I can arrange on a page, and sometimes it's fine tuning. I'm like, this line needs to be tightened up a bit. No, let's speed it up. What word can we use to do that? And so I spent a lot of time with the thesaurus. I'm like, no, I don't like this rhythm. Okay, I'll put it back in. Okay, let's see what it looks like now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me put on a different song. And so there are poems, in fact, the longer poems, each section of my body as a clenched fist was written to a different song. Mm -hmm. And it had to represent New York City, right, at the same time. But because they were at different stages, like there's a soundtrack when you're afflicted. There's a soundtrack for aftermath. There's a soundtrack when your body's under revolution and all that stuff, right? And so I try to find the right rhythm for each one. And the secret that I have is the last section was written with Natalie Merchant playing over and over and <laughs> over again. And so it's kind of like, you listen to Natalie Merchant? I was like, I listen to everything as long as it serves you know, me well, so yeah. Mm. I want to make sure that we have an opportunity to take questions from the audience. Uh, yes? I guess I'll jump right in. I, I recently uh, wrote a poem in Hawaiian Pigeon only because I thought I might have a minor understanding of it. And I thought to myself, am I misappropriating this culture? Um, we lived there for four years, so I was around people speaking Pigeon. How do you feel about a non-Hawaiian white guy writing Hawaiian pigeon poetry? That's not a question for me. That's a question for the Hawaiians. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. But you know. like, if, if I was writing it in Creole, and I've not been to Haiti, and I didn't live there for four years, how would you or how would you feel about it if I was writing it in more of a patois of Puerto Rico? Um. I guess for me, like, if you're writing, so there was a whole, like, genre of poetry in Puerto Rico that was written in kind of this, like, Afro-Puerto Rican, you know, like, and usually it was done by white men, right? Um, for me, that's a no, right? And I think part of that is, like, there's so much that you have to say in your own voice, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. that I want to hear that. You know what I mean? Like, I want to hear the stuff that you have to say in your voice. And I want them, and I want to hear their stories in their voice, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's more, it's, it's not about appropriation for me, it's about like, why are you not telling your own? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? Because that's like, I'm sure it's just as important, right? So it's kind of like, <coughs> Let's tell the stories that we have to tell, right? That are stories that we like have experience with that when we tell them, we're feeling what they really mean, you know? Yeah. Like I think that's, that's the thing. I want to hear if like, if she's telling a story, I want to hear hers, right? And that's like, I guess that's how I would look at it. Yeah. It's the same kind of thing for me. The question I always ask, especially when students are writing too, I said, what was the decision behind this? Why did you choose this line? Why did you choose this way of phrasing it? And I said, well, because I liked it. And I said, okay, can you go a bit deeper, right? Because it is about voice. It is about your own voice, but we lose perspective though, right? When we try to imitate other folks, your voice matters, as Sammy kind of mentioned, right? So we lose that perspective. So what is it like for you to be in Hawaii around people speaking a different language? Like that's uniquely your experience, right? Rather than taking that language and, and using it in that way. And so we would want to know what that experience is like. In fact, a lot of white voices are not heard about what it's like to be black in America. <laughs> because they don't write about it. And I've had a lot of friends like, can I write about this? I said, were you there? Mm. 
did it happen? Were you affected by it? Then yes, you can. But as you're writing it, whose perspective are you writing it from? If you try to write it from my perspective, you lost, you know, that, but if you write it from your perspective, you amplify the voice so that way I don't have to talk about what it was like for me to be in that situation. Because you can say, you wouldn't believe what I saw and it was messed up. And I feel supported, I feel, you know, I feel loved because you're not trying to use my language, but you're using your own voice to push my cause forward, right? Yeah. So I always say, go back to you, right? What about you? But ask the question too, why did I choose to tell the story in this way? And I will I'll add just a, a book recommendation. Um, Paisley Rechtal, who was one of our headliners in the 2019 Tell It's Night Poetry Festival, has an amazing book called Appropriate, A Provocation, in which she dives deep into the notion of cultural appropriation. It's an extremely readable book. It's written as a series of letters to a student who asked her about it. Highly, highly recommended for anyone who is interested at all in troubling the notion of culture and appropriation. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Would you like to hear some questions from our folks at home? Yes, we would love to hear questions from our folks at home, and thank you, Brooke, for, for bringing them to our attention. There are many. Oh, good. <laughs> thank if, you, if folks at home. If these questions inspire questions from you, who are in our live audience, we can bounce back and forth, okay? Um, so, who do, you write, who do you write for? Who is your imagined audience, Sammy? I write for me. Mm. I mean, because really it's like, it's, the, it's what I'm saying, what I need to say. And if you like it, cool. If you don't like it, what am I gonna do? You know? <laughs> you're you, you're gonna take it in the way you take it in. It's like, and if I'm writing for a specific group of people, I, I think that diminishes things in many ways. I write for myself. And the only other people I write for are the people in the poems, mm -hmm. right? Because those are, for me, those are the people who matter, right? Like, I love that you read my work, and if you like it, thank you, right? But I'm not writing poetry necessarily because I'm thinking about, oh, I really want a 25-year-old Puerto Rican male to read it. And you know, I'm really thinking about, am I writing the things that I want to write, that I need, that I feel I need to write? And in doing that, am I doing the people that I'm writing about a service or a disservice, right? So it's for me and for them. And for me, it's less about a who and more about a what. It's what I'm writing for, not who I'm writing for. Because if I consider all these pieces as a tool, then anybody can use them at any given time. Um, even though I dedicate my books, to, you know, especially my most recent book, to my, to my boys, because I want that to be an artifact. You know, some years later they'll look back and say, oh, daddy dedicated this book about what it's like to be a black man in America, right? And then they can look back, but in general, it's more about what do I want you to use this for? As Sammy mentioned, you don't know what, who's out there might be, who might be interested in this. Sometimes I'm surprised that people have come up to me at reading and say, when my body was a clenched fist about what it's like growing up as a black youth in New York City was exactly my experience. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? They're like, no, the trauma that you talked about and how the body does this. And we start a whole conversation about what it's like to carry trauma and different backgrounds, right? So it's more about a what. And for me, it's always about starting a conversation or furthering a conversation. Ruben, from uh, at home, um, noticed, speaking of coming off of what you just said, Enzo, um, he, was, he was really enjoying these beautiful uh, images that you were bringing to us, um, and that they were blended with trauma um, in your poems and, and displacement. So he's wondering, how does the beauty of poetry heal the pains of life? Hmm. I think poetry is a bomb, right? But 
you have to first recognize there's a wound, <laughs> right? And then you have to get that wound treated. And so the conversation I often have, especially around when my body was a clenched fist, I always say poetry is not therapy, it's therapeutic, yeah. right? And it's meant to be to complement the work that you're already doing, right? Um, it's not meant to be to take the place of it. Now, immediately it gives you a place to put things, right? But you cannot run away from the words on the page. And so all of a sudden you're dealing with things that just came from your mind or from your heart. So I always say to always make sure that you find two things before <laughs> you start crafting poems or even interrogating difficult poems, which is one, a, a support system, right? Whether that be a therapist, a group of friends, um, a very small group of writers, you know, don't workshop your poems in a huge group of people and expect that level of connection. Mm -hmm. And then the second is a plan for you as well. When you are writing and you do recognize that something feels uncomfortable, giving yourself permission to stop and then going back when it does feel comfortable. So there's a plan for that and to carve through it. Otherwise, you know, as Sammy kind of mentioned, like sometimes readers of poetry, you can see that they're experiencing the trauma as they're reading the work. And it's hard, it's difficult, but that's why you need to do that background work as well. So poetry helps. It helps a whole lot. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, it helps a whole lot. Like my whole life has been shaped by what poetry has done for me but it's always about doing the other work as well. What he said. <laughs> <laughs> He's good. Yes. And I, He's good. Because we're at the Tell It's Land Poetry Festival, I want to just take a moment and tie that to something that the Bell of Amherst once wrote. After great pain, a formal feeling comes. And I think of, of poetry as being a way to contain and to make manageable through the use of metaphor, through the use of imagery, the raw feelings that we experience, whether it, and, and it can be through trauma, it can be through joy. Um, but I think both of you accomplish that so beautifully in your work. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick check, do we have any other questions from the live in-person audience? Not seeing any hands. Brooke. Oh, wait. We've got one. <laughs> I don't know if it's fully formulated. I was really struck at, you know, in your dealing, in sort of looking at the whole issue of displacement, that there were kind of two main branches. You know, there was the body and there was home. Mm. And, you know, sort of talking about, you know, how, uh, and, 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 and you, you both kind of crossed over in that. I think Enzo was more in the body, Sammy more, more in the home. but. Um, What, 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 what's, what's the question? Um, yeah, I mean, how, how do you sort of work through kind of living, or how, how did you come to that understanding of sort of what it means to be in a body, that, in experiencing a body that's being displaced, whether it's through trauma mm -hmm. or, 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 or violence? Um, and, how do you, and how do you understand sort of the dis the experience of, of, of a home that's been displaced you know, through diaspora or economic forces or things like that. Mm. Mm. I mean, I think if you just, if you're in any city in America and you think about how many evictions happen, mm -hmm. if you think about, you know, how many folks are struggling to find somewhere where they can live and survive, mm -hmm. right? Um, if it, like for me as a Puerto Rican, again, it's that idea of what is home, mm -hmm. right? Because when I go to Puerto Rico, they're like, well, are you from over there? And when I go yeah. over here, oh, you're Puerto Rican, you speak good English. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I don't really like, you know, so there's this, this feeling of like, where exactly is home and where do you make home, right? Mm -hmm. And everything, oh, you're from New York. Yeah, but I'm also, I'm a DC poet, right? So DC is the home that birthed my poetry, right? Mm -hmm. And New York is a home that birthed the rhythms that sometimes like, you know, are in the poetry. Um, so there's no escaping trying to figure out what home is, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, 
And I think it really comes down to, like, for me, like, watching people decide, have to make a decision about home. Mm -hmm. And also having some of those same people being robbed of the ability to make a decision of what is home, mm -hmm. right? Hurricane Maria mm -hmm. made it real easy mm -hmm. for people to say, I can't, I can't be here, mm -hmm. right? So they left Puerto Rico and ended up in Orlando or New York or in other like parts of the country, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The Civil War in El Salvador made it real easy to have to leave, right? Mm -hmm. Because what would you do, you know? I mean, and you think about all the conflicts that the U.S. itself has kind of like initiated in other countries, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. home, and then we can't even call this home sometimes, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Even though we're here because of something that was done by the country we ran to, right? So it's like, it's a constant question for me, mm -hmm. right? Because I don't know. I don't know where I should belong, where you should belong, whether we belong together or not, and I'm trying to figure it out still. You know, I always think about how the body is home, right? It's your first home, mm -hmm. you know, before you get that eviction notice, right? <laughs> That's this time, right? Um, but it starts from there, right? It, it starts as this vessel that carries, and I think once you stay connected to that. Um, which, by the way, I think is one of the most beautiful things to have happen in, in, in nature, right? Mm -hmm. To have this, um, which is why I don't understand why women's rights is not at the top of everything, by the way, right? So, that's just saying that. But think about it, you carry, right? You carry yourself in places, too. And so you bring with you whatever, you, you know, all these different experiences. And so, when we talk about New York City, like I always say, I'm from Queens, and even though I've been in Massachusetts for you know some time now, like there's an element of me that's still very much Queens. Mm -hmm. There's an element that's still very much you know Haiti. And so we carry these components, these parts of ourselves, within the body, and within our mind. Because truthfully, the whole world only exists in your head. And so it starts with the body, and then you go outwards. And what we do when we reach out is confirmation. Mm -hmm. and affirmation, right? And so, are you home to me? Well, it depends on how much you reflect the kind of love, you know, that I'm dishing out. Mm -hmm. So it starts for me always with the body. Yeah. Do we have time for one more question? We do. Um, one of your loves your work. She really appreciates your insights. And she is wondering, when did you start writing? And what was the first memory you have about when you started to write? Um, I wrote crappy poems in high school <laughs> that ended up in the yearbook, which I hide on a shelf. <laughs> but I really started writing when I started writing with my students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if it, and all, I, I believe all of the books in the dedications, it's for my students, you know, because they're the ones who said, look, you can't expect us to do something that you're not willing to do, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and I thought I was just gonna teach them poetry because I love poetry, and then they were like, no. So all my firsts in poetry were with my kids. My first open mic was with a group of my students. Mm -hmm. My first actual reading on a stage was with my students. Um, Again, my first loss in a poetry contest was <laughs> to my student, right? So it's just kind of like all of these like things happened with them, you know? So that's where, that for me is where it began and it continued because DC's poetry community is such a pretty one. Mm. Like they're super like accepting and welcoming mm. and <laughs> they hold you accountable, mm. right? You want to write? Who you reading? Okay, that statement does not make you look good, right? So how you gonna shift it, right? So it was all this like it was a combination of being in D.C. and having students tell me I needed to write, and having a community of poets who said, 
Oh, you're writing. You know, because that same community of poets at the open mic that I was at with the kids, the minute those kids came off the stage, this community of writers came over to those 14-year-olds and not to say, oh, that was nice, <laughs> but to say, so why'd you pick that word for that particular line? Right, so you have these 14 year olds being treated as writers. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's a community I wanna be a part of, mm -hmm. right? So that's where it all started, mm -hmm. for real, for real. Yeah. In a lot of ways, mine came from a very similar um, experience. So I mentioned that I was writing scripts and so forth, right? And then, you know, junior high school hits and we have this substitute teacher and everybody's throwing spitballs and paper wall fights and all that stuff, right? Being introverted, I was in a corner somewhere and it was raining that day and I was looking outside and it looked like, so the rain was coming down a tree, much like the rain yesterday. <laughs> um, and it looked like, and I said, oh, it looks like the tree is crying the way this rain is, you know, cascading down the tree. And I said, do trees get sad? So is this tree crying? And I was like, wait, is this tree crying because it's sad? Or is this street crying because it knows that I'm sad, but I can't cry my own tears? That line scared me because I was like, where the heck did that come from? But then I recognized that I had all these questions as a kid. What about this? What about that? And poetry became a way for me to interrogate that, to explore that in a very safe way. Because if I had asked someone, hey, do you think this tree's crying? Because, you know, <laughs> it thinks I'm sad, but I can't cry. You know, and so you think about that, right? But it became a safe way for me to ask all of these questions. And the beauty of that is when my boys ask such questions now, I'm like, yeah, I was like, yeah, go ahead with that, you know? And I support them because at that point, poetry for me became about asking the most profound questions or weird questions mm. as possible because it became about self-expression. So, and I love that. I love seeing the weirdness of what I was thinking on paper. Emily Dickinson wrote in a letter to a, a friend. She had shared some poems with him. And I think he basically wrote back, eh? <laughs> and she wrote, all men say, what to me? <laughs> I thought it was fashion. <laughs> That's, that's why I love Emily Dickinson. That's why she, she's my boo. <laughs> well, I want to thank all of you in the audience, both here in person at the UMass Museum of Contemporary Art, and those of you who have joined us virtually. Uh, we are grateful for you being here, giving your attention to poetry from Sammy Miranda and Enzo Simon Surin. Uh, those of you who are here in the gallery have the opportunity to purchase books directly from our poets. Those of you joining us virtually can certainly purchase books from our poets online. Uh, we do have additional programming for the Tell It Slant Poetry Festival happening tonight. Our headline reading with Marilyn Nelson and Abigail Shabatnoy will be happening at the Homestead at 7 o'clock? 7 p.m. 7 p.m., good, I still know what time it is. Um, followed by the late night garden party with music from Daphne Parker Powell. And tomorrow morning there will be a master class with Abby Shabatnoy that's happening at 9 a.m. You can find details for that on the Tell It Slant Festival site. Again, thank you all so much for being here. I'm Michael Mercurio, Sammy Miranda, Enzo Simon Surin, thank you.